Welcome in to the Warchant.com report. I'm Jeff Cameron of ESPN Radio, alongside Ira Chaffel, Warchant.com, Gene Williams, Warchant.com, Florida State, Wake Forest, 330, good old Snuggy Hill. Check your local listings, either ABC or ESPN2. Uh, well, <laughs> this is a toughie. we got to start right off the bat with uh, the details of a loss that uh, sent Florida State to 0-2 for the first time since 1989 and out of the AP poll for the first time since 2011. Gene, you get the honors. How big of a setback was Saturday's loss, and what does it mean for the season and I guess the program as a whole? Well, I think we're going to – we want to jump to conclusions, but it's going to be defined by how the season plays out. It really is because, you know, in theory, you run the table, you, you're going to look back at that game and go, well, that was the one that got away after that long layoff. It could have been maybe in the playoffs so or that kind of thing. So we don't know yet. But here's the other thing with Jimbo Fisher. When has he not had one of these games? He's had it two out of the eight years, 13 and 14. He didn't have one of these inexplicable ACC losses. So, again, if it's just one of those, you go, well, this is just the life at Florida State. He's going to have those kind of things. But if you lose another couple ACC games, it is going to be, is it going to be that defining moment like Louisville in 2002? And we all kind of realize, wow, this program really is headed in the wrong direction. It's going the way we didn't expect. So, I mean, I think we're going to have to look back at the end of the year and see how important this loss it really is. So the perspective of time will help decide the answer there. Is it realistic to expect that Jimbo Fisher and his staff will right the ship here, Ira, and weather the storm and, and win uh, the vast majority of these remaining games? Yeah, I had a piece on uh, the site this week, on our, my 3 two, one piece, where I mentioned that really there's probably been three times that a, a lot of fans, our growing number of fans, were very frustrated with Jimbo Fisher and his staff and felt like maybe uh, changes needed to be made with the staff overall. overall. Uh, and all of those times, they righted the ship. After you know, 2011, they lost three straight games, including that loss at Wake Forest. They turned it around, finished the year, I think, 7-1. and one. They went, went to a bowl game, did really well. Uh, after the 2012 season, when they lost all the assistant coaches, people started wondering, well, maybe something's going wrong here. If you lost six assistant coaches in the offseason, next year they win a national title. Last year, the first half of the season was a disaster, especially on defense. Everybody started thinking, okay, Charles Kelly's got to go. The staff is a disaster. Then they finished the season really strong, won 7-1 down the stretch, won the Orange Bowl. So again, he's shown time and time again the ability in his staff to, to turn things around when they look dire. But to Gene's point, you've already lost two games. You have uh, a Miami game that's losable. Louisville now looks very losable at home uh, after what they did to you last year. you got to go to Clemson. you got to go to Florida. I mean, you could see a scenario where this team loses five or six games, and then all of a sudden you're in deep trouble. Well, and this is on the heels, Gene, of uh, stuff that occurred last year through the first half of the season, which frustrated fans to no end. I guess to, to, to you, what I would ask, what was the biggest thing that stood out to you in this loss? couple things. I guess the uh, first, the offensive line is, again, like we've seen the last few years. I mean, it, maybe it's bad again. Uh, that, that was really disappointing to see. We got a little bit of fool's gold, maybe that Alabama game, thinking maybe they'd turn things around. But the biggest thing is the defense. I mean, wh- where was the defense? That was supposed to carry the team. That was the thing that was a sure thing. This was a dominating defense. And looked, frankly, very average. There was nothing special about that group on Saturday. Yeah, they don't get takeaways. They don't create a lot of big plays. It's just a, and, and again, that's a de- that's an offense where they don't turn the ball over much. But again, that's you know, again, I think they, this team needed that defense to be dominant early this season, and they have not been dominant. Well, and the one time they did create a turnover and they did have an interception, they got jobbed by the officials on a terrible call, and mm-hmm. you know that's awfully frustrating. I, I don't get the off coverage and some of the soft underneath stuff. Uh, NC State hasn't shown the propensity to throw the ball down the field. Why are you playing off and allowing all that underneath stuff? It, it really made. Uh, life easy on NC State. You're right, and very frustrating. And these are some of the rumblings that folks have had about Charles Kelly, the defensive coordinator now, for a number of years since he's been elevated to defensive coordinator. Of course, your complaint at the outset there with Rick Trickett, uh, fans have him on the hot seat every single season. You know, I thought in the first half they blocked much better than they did in the second half, but uh, I guess absent a substantial turnaround, fellas, Do you expect uh, Jimbo Fisher at the end of this year to finally make a change? He doesn't like to fire coaches. He never has, ever, under any circumstance. Well, we had a – he left, but there were some other extenuating circumstances. We're not going to really get into that. But he didn't want to do that even, I don't think. I think Right, it wasn't performance-related. So I don't think he likes to do that. I guess if it plays out and there's another dud of a game somewhere along the way, do you think he makes changes? 
if again, like I said, if you, this season you end up with, you know, our point at all those games, if you lose two or three of those and you're a four or five loss team, I think you have to. There's no way. But what's going to happen at the end of the year? You're going to have you have home games against Syracuse and Delaware State. If you go into those games with four or five losses, what do you think the crowd's going to be like? It's going to be a ghost town there, and you can't have a situation like that. And then go into the next season, and go, yeah, we're bringing back all our coaches again. If that defense continues to underachieve, if the offensive line continues to again play horribly, and you get your quarterback injured, which is very possible at this rate. You're going to have to do something. You can't sit around again. The definition of insanity is brought up and over and over. But if you keep doing this over and over with the same coaches getting the same results, you got to change it or you're nuts. Well, think about those games. Think about the optics if they do reschedule that ULM game for the last oh. week after the Florida game. I mean, there'll be. To get set, bowl eligible? We might be the only oh. ones there. But, but, but. <laughs> serious version of the and then, .com report here, folks. And then again, the problem with the, de- the defensive lapses this year is this is a defense that's loaded with experience. You're yeah. losing. All those players up front are seniors. And they're playing in the league. Yeah, and those guys are going to be playing in the league. Well, you're going to lose a lot of juniors. It's it's uh, you're going to be rebuilding defensively next year. You should be great on offense, but again, to, to for this team with that defense to lose five or five games or so would be disastrous. We'll see if they do. I don't think they're going to yeah. lose five games, yeah. but I do know this: that ultimately, it's not unreasonable for fans to expect teams to play to their potential. If you recruit as well as Florida State recruits, you ought not lose head-scratching games to teams with inferior talent on a regular basis. And short of the Jameis Winston years, Florida State has. That's, there's no other way to get around. Four straight top five recruiting classes. Wake Forest is undefeated, by the way. 4-0. and oh. Got a little something waiting for Florida State, perhaps. Snuggy Hill. Dave Clawson doing a good job there. We'll talk about Wake Forest next on the Warchant.com report. Welcome back to the Warchant.com report. Florida State, Wake Forest. Wake Forest, a robust 4-0 for the first time ever. They and Duke are 4-0 in the same season. That's just an aside. Florida State, however, has not won a game 0-2, if you're wondering at the house. So I ask you, Ira, Gene, how important is winning on Saturday against Wake Forest? How important is winning playing well against Wake Forest? And then I suppose, how devastating would a loss be? Yeah, I think we'll have to mull that, that last one over for a little <laughs> bit. On but, that one. but as far as uh, how, how important it is to win, it, it's huge. I mean, this is a big game for Florida State. They have to get back on the right track. Uh, I don't know if winning and playing well matters as much. I, I don't think that you could win by 30 points and nobody's going to feel better about this season or feel better about this team. Um, you know, just they got to win the game. They just have to win the game and then clean up some of the things that they've had issues with. This season, They, I mean, just this last week, they had issues again with – uh, handling uh, you know the eye violations, getting misdirection, getting beat on things like that, and then also the wide receivers just getting lined up right. Uh, I mean, there's just so many little things that they're not doing well right now. I think that's the most important thing. And getting a, a win, if they lost this game, I mean, I just I can't even imagine the venom that would be coming from Florida State's fan base. Well, you really can't fathom it, right? I mean, Gene, you you, you check the message boards. Obviously, it would be a total meltdown. But also from a recruiting standpoint, you would start to be really affected. I would think and. Yeah. Uh, Jimbo's status as as somebody that is in good favor right now with the fans would certainly fall into a place that we haven't seen at any point since he's arrived. Well, I mean, you brought up some points there, and that's why I really think this is a crossroads game. This really is. You cannot a loss in a word is devastating, not only to this season but to the program. Because let's let's be honest about it. Your first loss, you lost to the number one team of the country. They're going up beating right. teams by fifty points. They're really good. Okay, you get a pass. You had a th- weird three-week layoff. You played a team that's probably a little bit underrated, honestly. I mean, we all kind of put them aside after that South Carolina game. But they were supposed to be a, a pretty good little team, and they are a decent team. They're going to make some noise this year, so they're decent. You had some rough edges at home. You lost. Okay, those kind of games happen. There's no excuse to lose to Wake Forest. Yeah, they're 4-0, but come on, beating Presbyterian and these other teams. You're Florida State. They're Wake Forest. Athlete for athlete, you're better than them at every single position. If you go up there and go 0-3, the first time since 76, by the way, that FSU would be 0-3, it's a complete game changer for this program. You absolutely cannot lose this game. I really have a hard time believing that that will happen. I think I've watched Wake play a little bit, and it is deceiving 4-0. That, that athlete for athlete, this game should not be close. Wake Forest, we know they love to run that zone read with John Walford, and he's very good at it. And, you know, they return a total of 15 starters on the whole, a lot of those guys on offense. And, you know, I guess, I guess when you look, he's the only guy, Ira, that – really Florida State has to worry about. He's their number one rusher. He's their number one passer, obviously. He makes the whole thing go. 
Yeah, he's an explosive player. There's no question. And, and it's kind of uh, what we need to see from this game. It's hard to tell. Is he that much improved from a year ago? Or is it because of the competition they played, as Gene mentioned? I mean, uh, last year against Florida State, he completed less than 50% of his passes, had a couple of interceptions, showed the athleticism, but wasn't nearly the passer that on paper he is right now. Right now, completing about 60% of his passes, has eight touchdowns with no interceptions. That's pretty impressive for a guy that's not known as a, as a, a true passer. He's much more of an athlete. Uh, and then running the ball, he's obviously very, very dangerous. Averages, I think, almost six yards a carry. He is our leading rusher. Uh, he's a mobile quarterback that FSU's had str- struggles with in the past. The zone read stuff can be challenging. So uh, I think he'll present challenges. I don't know if over the course of a game if he could take the punishment. That's the key. Florida State has to inflict punishment on him. This won't be a case like Ryan Finley where they can never get to him. They're going to get opportunities to make him pay, and they have to do that. Other players to watch, Gene? Well, I think there are a couple other players to watch in this thing. I think that's most like said, the eight touchdowns. He does throw the football around. He has a couple pretty good receivers. Greg Dorch is the leading wide receiver. And then Cam Serenay, we may know about him. He's all ACC. He's a guy that's really good. Here's a stat for on Serenay for you, by the way. He's got four touchdowns so far this season. You know how many catches he has? Four. Five. So it's a, he's hit 80%. It's pretty good. Let me, a little, let me throw a little advice out to Florida State's defensive staff. When you get in the red zone, you might want to we'll cover him. that guy because they might throw to him. So I would say those are really the two. That's pretty much it. Those two guys are the entire receiving game. When he does throw, and he's not going to throw that often, you're right, he's completing 60%, but he doesn't like to throw. They want to run the football. He's going to have to. They're going to be sneaky about it. And when they do, it's going to be one of these two guys. Discipline would be the key here if you're going against Wake Forest offense and making them pay. Absolutely. I I agree with you. I I don't know how Wake Forest is going to move the ball consistently against Florida State's defense. And before you chuckle at home, I know. I understand. I get it. Right now is probably not the time to champion the defense after what you just saw Saturday. This is a mismatch. Florida State's defensive line should dominate this football game. Period. We'll see if they do. They should be angry, you would think. Well, you'd like to believe that. Wake Forest defense returns an awful lot of starters up front, not so much in the secondary, sophomore late in the secondary, but up front they return three or four of their dominating defensive tackles. Well, dominating for Wake, their best players up front, including the transfer that they brought in, who's a nice player as well. Uh, You know, Jimbo Fisher talking a little bit about Wake Forest's defense here. Really good defensive football team. If you go back and look, they're probably one of the top. I don't know what they're ranked right now, but they're really high in defense, and and they have been. You go back and look at the film last year. Even even last year, the teams that got it, if you remember the Louisville, Louisville looked like they scored 40 points, but if you remember, it was 12 to 6 or, I mean, 10 to 3, 10 to 7. I don't know what it was, something like that with – yeah, all the way into the fourth quarter. You know what I mean? Clemson the same way. I mean, they, they broke late because they had to take chances on offense and then finally turned the ball over and did some things. But defensive, man, they're a heck of a football team. That's Jimbo Fisher talking Wake Forest defense. Ira, what has Wake done so well in this great start? Well, and really the last couple of years against Florida State, they've had success. If you look back to you know the last two years, Florida State's had a hard time scoring a lot of points against Wake Forest. And I think it's, it's similar to what they do right now is they're just solid. They're just solid. They're not overwhelming in any one area. They're not great. They don't have uh, dynamic five-star players across the uh, team, but they are solid. If you go, go back to last season, Dalvin Cook had 115 yards rushing against Wake Forest, but it took him 25 carries to do it. His longest run was 18 yards. Two years before that, it's kind of hard to say. It's hard, kind of hard to use that as a comparison, though, because Dalvin went down with the injury early, had the long run. He got hurt. And also you had Everett Golson at quarterback. So Florida State didn't put up a lot of points in that game, but there, there are some reasons for that. But, but last year they played them well. They gave Florida State fits, and I think they will again. It's not a defense, again, that's going to make a ton of big plays, but they're not going to beat themselves either. I think in general they're well coached. What's yeah. unique about this group for me? Well, it's kind of like Groundhog Day. It seems like whenever Florida State's played teams lately, they have this experienced front seven. You mentioned that, Jeff, earlier. Everybody in that front seven is either a redshirt junior, a senior, or redshirt senior. So the minimum experience is four years in the system, which goes to that thing. They're not going to make mistakes. They're going to be solved. But I will say they have one pretty nice player at defensive end, and that's Duke Edgefor. He is a guy, some of the ratings have him as one of the top five defensive ends coming out in next year's NFL draft. He's pretty good. He measures an exact, and I don't think he's quite the level of Bradley Chubb, but he's a good player. He measures in the same exact measurable, 6'4", 275. I would say after what happened with Chubb last week, you better account for this guy. You better have a guy to chip him because if it gets a situation where he's going after Blackman and he's getting back there consistently, we saw that's going to be a major issue, so you need to account for that guy. Which players need to step up in order for Florida State to win? Keys to the game and our picks. That's all coming up next on the Warchant.com report. 
Welcome back. Warchant.com report. Uh, obviously, for TV info, you're going to want to check your local listings wherever you are. Also, you can always go to the Warchant.com game day page for the complete list of game watching locations throughout the entire country. So that's certainly convenient. Players that need to step up this weekend for Florida State in order to get a win. I'll start with Eugene. Who's got to step up here? A lot of guys that need to step up that we expect a lot from so far. Let me start with Josh Sweat. I mean, this guy was supposed to be the elite defensive end, kind of disappeared in the game against NC State. I think he needs to step up in a game like this, especially with them running all that zone read in there. He's going to have to contain and do do all those things that a really good pro-level defensive end is going to have to do to step up. And then can we say Derwin James? Was he the number one player in the country at any position according to two major national media outlets? Well, he needs to play like one. So far, he's been, eh, he's been okay, and he looked pretty bad trying to make that open field tackle on that long touchdown by NC State. Let me just also throw out Nyquan Murray, who's been very average. And if Auden Tate, by the time we're taping this, we don't know Auden Tate's status, if he's going to be able to play. If he's not, Nooney really needs to step up and play better. I would have said Nyquan Murray. I'll echo that. Uh, players that have to step up in your mind. I went with position groups. I went with Entire the, groups. I'm not just going individual players. I went with the, the wide receivers and the defensive backs. I mean, I think the, the wide receivers, Florida State's lines of scrimmage have not been that bad. Uh, the wide receivers uh, have got to, I mean, they, they have to help this young quarterback out. Going into that game against NC State, we all said the, the wide receivers have to kind of help elevate James Black and Blackman and make things easier on him. In a lot of cases, they made things harder, not getting lined up correctly, uh, just making mistakes, not blocking properly on bubble screens, things like that. They have to step up. And the, the defensive backs, I think, have made some just huge blunders. There are periods where they played well, but they're, they have made some huge mistakes in some of these games to the start of the season, uh, some busted coverages, things we saw in the first half of last season. You just got to see more from those two groups. We'll exclude you, Auden Tate, from that list. Hopefully you play. He's been wildly consistent and really the only guy that you could truly count on in that receiving group. You're right with Nooney Murray, though. He's, he's kind of been persona non grata. You can't find Nooney Murray when you need him here. Uh, in your mind, I guess that leads us to uh, you know players that have underachieved, and I think we just named them as well. <laughs> I mean, we have yeah, yeah, you know, guys, you know, we, we've got that, but keys to victory then from this point. You know, I think establishing the running game, I think your first two opponents were really good against the run. I think Wake Forest is decent against the run. I think they ranked like 50th nationally. So, I mean, I think this is a team you can actually run effectively against, take the pressure off of James Black. And, boy, if you could run for 150-plus yards in this game and, and balance the offense. I know Jimbo Fisher brought up all the examples of the bubbles and all the other things that he counts as run. But, come on, we need runs from the line of scrimmage with the running backs. I think that will open things up quite a bit. Get some three and outs and some turnovers. You think that might be big? I mean, they've really lacked that zero turnovers in two games. I think that would be big for the team. And then finally, how about getting ahead early? All these games, you don't want to go to Snuggy Hill and fall behind 13 to 3 or 17 to 3 or whatever. 77, is that what it is? There's no, don't do that. For once, get ahead in the game. I think if you can take care of those three things, they'll be just fine. Tackle, man. Tackle at the line of scrimmage. And, and you brought it up before, but I think that's a big key. Uh, name some other keys to the game in your mind. Well, I also had the fast starts. I was talking about more of the fast start on defense. They have to come in and mm-hmm. shut somebody down and give the offense a time to get going. Because, again, like Gene said, when you're on Snuggy Hill, if you get <laughs> they behind, get away from you quickly. the people in the, on the hill might stop, like look away from their line for a minute and actually start, start paying to cheer, attention to the game. Start, start kind of loud. Their kids will stop running and playing like Parcheesi, and they'll actually come over. and <laughs> and so, so it's So uh, it could be an ugly scene yeah, there. Yeah. So, uh, when no. they stop playing Parcheesi, <laughs> you got problems. It's Snuggy Hill. It's so anyway, yeah, just a faster start on defense. And then also one thing before this game, a key to this game to me is this week in practice and how Jimbo Fisher and this coaching staff got these guys to be focused. All of their big goals are gone. I mean, they're still mathematically alive in the ACC, and if they ran the table, something crazy could happen. But for the most part, when you look at the fact they have to go to Clemson, they have to still have to play Lamar Jackson Louisville, their goals for the conference and nationally are pretty much shot. How are they going to regroup from that? How are they going to focus? Can they do what they did last year? And not let that bring them down. Get on a big run. Speaking of running, gosh, you got to find some commitment to that run yeah. game. Florida State has a stable of running backs that would be the envy of the country for the most part. And, you know, really haven't seen a commitment to that. You're right, though. They've played two defenses that are very good against the run. Time for the weekly picks. Let's have at it, boys. Miami's giving six to Duke on a Friday night. Ooh. 4-0 Duke. Miami at Duke. Minus six. 
What say you? I've been riding Duke all season. I think they've covered every game, so I'm going to keep riding the Dukies on this one. My, you just don't roll into Duke. What is Miami thinking on this one? Wallace Wade? And their favorite? Don't roll into Wallace Miami's Wade. A favorite? I'm not really buying into Miami yet either, so I, I think Duke could win this thing straight up, especially on a Friday night, a little odd atmosphere up there. I'll take Miami. Wow, I'm happy to take the points in Duke. I'm not not impressed with the uh, the Canes yet. I'm not impressed, but it's Duke. Mm-hmm. If Miami loses to Duke, we got issues here. This hell of a situation for Florida State and Miami the following week, huh? If that happens, this is a scene of the crime of the crazy uh, oh, return. Oh, the do play, ago, yeah, right? with all the penalties not called. Southern Cal given three and a half against Washington State. I think one thing I've noticed about Southern Cal is no matter what I pick, I'm wrong every time. I think I'm like 0 for 12 picking against the spread against Southern Cal. So I, who the hell You don't knows? know, right? Uh, the thing is, whatever I pick, go the opposite way. And USC's up and down, up and down. They look really good, and then they look awful. Go ahead and give me USC. It's only three and a half points. They're the better team. I'll take USC. I'm with Gene again. It's a vote against Mike Leach. Mississippi Ooh. State's at Auburn. Weird Mississippi State Ooh. team, obviously. They lay the wood to LSU and then turn around and get boat raced by Georgia. Auburn's given nine and a half. They took care of business as they were supposed to against Missouri. Nine and a half is a big number. I'll take Mississippi State getting the nine and a half. Yeah, I think the thing on that, I think you're right. Auburn's going to win, but they're not great, and they don't have very good offense. That's a huge number for a team that struggles a little bit on offense. Yeah, I'm with you. Too many points, Mississippi State. Same here. Same here. We're all good with Mississippi State. Vandy's at Florida. Florida's given seven and a half. I don't think if I were, uh, you know, setting the line here, I'd pick Florida by seven and a half over anybody. Like ever. They haven't come all season, you have they? It. I'm anybody. I'll take uh, Vandy to keep it close in the swamp. I mean, they haven't covered all season. It's Vandy at home, really? It's a touchdown? It's a swamp, seven and a it's half. It's Vandy at home. I don't know. I, it, they haven't covered all season. I'm going to go with Florida on this one. I, they just they can't be as bad as they've looked. Can they? Sure they can. I'll take Vandy getting the seven and a half. Yeah, I'll take, take Vandy as well. Not, yeah. only wow. they, not only are they not very good, but they're also in the middle of this crazy credit card scandal. George has given oh. seven and a half to Tennessee. This is the put you out of your misery game, Butch. It's all over but the oh. shouting. Georgia wins going away in front of all 100,000 plus fans uh, in Neyland. Gosh. I, I, I'm so tempted to say because Georgia always does this. You know, this is the time when they're riding high, they're looking good, they look like the best team in the East, and then they fall flat on their face. But I guess that was a different coaching staff, so I will go ahead. I don't like that little hook on the end of it, but I will go with the uh, Bulldogs on this one. Former uh, FSU GA, Kirby Smart, getting it done. And, uh, yeah, Rocky Bottom. In, yeah, uh, Rocky this bottom. is it. They're rocking out here, and then it's all over in the uh, – over but the shouting for him in Tennessee. Uh, Clemson's given seven at Virginia Tech. Best game of the week. It is a great game. Can't wait to watch this game. My man Fuente is coaching him up there at Virginia Tech. I'll take Virginia Tech getting the seven. Really? Keep it, keep it reasonably close. Really? Yeah, you know, Clemson at times has looked Clemson pretty was up by seven late in the third quarter against uh, Boston yeah. College this past weekend. Yeah, and they're, you know what? I think still they're struggling offensively at Virginia Tech. They're going to rise up. They're pretty good defensively. So I think they should have some trouble in that game. I'm with you, Jeff. I think Clemson ekes out a win, but seven's a lot of points. It's a lot of points. I'll take the points as well, and I wouldn't be shocked if they knock them off. Florida State's given seven and a half. Take the mighty Knowles. Give the points all day long. They crushed Wake Forest convincingly. We get the bad taste out of our mouth. Florida State wins 50 to 7. <laughs> Whoa! 50 Jeffrey! To 7. Big win for the Knowles. So, this is one of those ones you, I know you pick your certain, you're, you're a, you know, a person, kind of a, yeah, pro, a semi guy pro guy. there yeah, on that yeah, kind of thing. So, this is one of those ones you're putting the lock on. Knowles, Knowles, and a run away. So, a, yeah, college funds, put your mortgages. mortgage on it. Hey, Knowles, big. Jeff's not even hesitating. Yeah, right. big, big. Sure, that's water in that uh, big, big, big win. Ooh, my big, goodness, big, big win. I, you know, I'm with you. That I mean, like I said, this team is absolutely their backs are against the wall. Florida State's got a history of when their backs are against the wall, they step up, they play much better. This team has to be embarrassed. You can see it in the players' eye. They're very annoyed by what happened. Athlete for athlete, they're better than Wake. I'm not as optimistic as Jeff. I'm going to slow my roll a little bit and go 24 13. Still cover the spread. But, man, I, I, I have to see them go out and dominate someone first before I'm just going to throw that kind of number out. Well, you're going to be happy. Snuggy Hill is going to be All dismayed. Right. Parcheesi is going to be going on late <laughs> into the night. Yeah, they're see. not stopping their Parcheesi for this one. I see an ugly win. I see 21-13. Oh! Yep. I feel like Boom. it's going to be very unsatisfying. That is But unsatisfying. they are going to get the win. And uh, we're all Cover by one point. Hey, if, half a if, point. If, if Florida State wins 21-13 and looks as bad as you're describing here, we man... I mean, is the streak over against Miami? Well, what are we going to be doing here? See, it might be a different effort against Miami. I just it's going to wear them down, so they'll be. 
All right, there's our picks. Okay, 50 to 7 might have been a bit over the top. I get that. <laughs> But I like. I, try, I was trying to make the point. Florida State, big. You should have gone le- big, big. last. Is the big finish? No, yeah, I want to get fine. out of the way. I wanted to see where. I knew you guys were going to be worried about Florida <laughs> State. You guys were. Gonna, if you were going to pick them, you were barely going to pick them. I wanted to let you know from the beginning. All in on a big win this weekend. Uh, for Gene Williams and Irish Chappelle, good job, Ryan Kelly. I'm Jeff Cameron. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Go Knowles. We'll talk to you next time.